Nichols Nimit House Hotel in the heart of Devon. It's four weeks after a planning inquiry has decided to allow a wind farm to be built in the valley below. This is encouraging, isn't it? A meeting's been called at short notice. Hi, I'm Muriel. Hotel owner Muriel Goodman is praying for a good turnout. She fears the wind farm will ruin her business. It's a last-ditch attempt to stop the wind farm that's divided the community. I've been rattling chains in It's a battle that's been going on for the last three years. I'll put two up for now and leave it at that for the moment. There's also the benefits to the farmers. The rental's going to give them a stable, regular income. The wind farm is the dream of project developer Rachel Ruffle. I want everyone to love wind farms and they're not to be protesters. That's so who'd like one of these in their garden? So I'll now begin by formally opening... At the public inquiry, the Denbrook Valley Action Group opposed the plans. ...against the decision of the West. But one man took on the developers over his fears about wind farm noise. They're nicking our tranquility. They're stealing it. It's highway robbery. Absolutely no persuasive evidence before this inquiry that the background noise measurements are anything other than professionally made, robust and reliable. It's here. When the decision came through, oh my God. Rachel's dream became reality. Yeah. The wind farm would be built. There's not enough room to do a cartwheel. <laughs> but this story of how the battle for our future played out in one Devon Valley is not over yet. An appeal could still be launched. Don't worry, no problem. He got home back to Oh dear. Oh. Come in, Muriel's called her meeting with fellow campaigner Hello. Mike Hume. Here we go again. What we're doing is we've, we've found what we see as a flaw in the noise condition. Right. So we're into the nitty gritty. Rest say the wind farm will supply electricity for up to 13,000 homes. <laughs> and bring jobs and investment. Don't know who I'm saying hello to. But they haven't convinced the campaigners. The dilemma is we need commitments on money tonight. Basically, it seems to me we've got one opportunity left if we yeah. want to do anything other than just sit back and let this wind farm go ahead, and that is to make a, a challenge to this appeal decision. There's a case happened in Shipton in Norfolk where Dr Hall challenged the appeal decision on the noise condition and has just won it. The dilemma is there's no time. We've got 27 days to actually get it laid on the developers. John Constable of the Renewable Energy Foundation has effectively been sort of nurturing me along this road, if you like, because it needs people who are affected to make the challenge. It's no good an outside organisation doing it. Um, and he certainly recommends Susan Ring, this solicitor. She's been there and done it before. I don't really want to take this on on my own. I haven't got time and I haven't got the expertise. I would like a sort of, for everybody to, as much as possible, to be involved. So if someone's got a particular area they want looking at. I think the noise issue is the one that we go with, possibly if we go with it, purely and simply because it is a way of making a judicial review or whatever. It may not affect all of us noise-wise. Some of us may live miles away. Um, some, of we do, some, of, some of us do. Um, <clears throat> but it's just, it's just a, a means to an end, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do, you do you think there's anyone in the area there? who'd be willing to underwrite the whole thing? So are you looking for people to sign up to a certain and say... Yeah, <coughs> I mean, is that it? Yeah, really, to, to be honest with you, yes. I have actually bought my checkbook. Oh, Quinton, you are wonderful. Um, to launch the challenge, Mike must instruct solicitors very soon. This will initially cost about three thousand pounds. So, what are you doing? Is something that everyone can sign? Yeah, well, separately. I pledge to give the Denbrook Judicial Review. They'll need to launch an official fund, have a treasurer, and give receipts for any pledges given. Have you done the hens? Take one, pass it on, I guess is the easiest thing. Bit by bit, what was to be called the Denbrook Judicial Review Fund comes into being. Who would like to be the chairman? Because I don't want to be. No, I don't want to be. Mike and Muriel had invited the former campaigners, the Denbrook Valley Action Group Committee. But at this stage, no one was able to attend. Nick, Jules. They've said that they're not interested in following this noise 
condition approach. The implication is that they are considering alternative yes. approaches. I think yeah. they are. In fact, the Denbrook Valley Action Group had taken legal advice that told them there is only a 20% chance any judicial review would succeed and a judge would be likely to act with benevolence towards the planning inspector's decisions. As a group, they may well decide not to pursue further action. And that, that doesn't include the thousand that we've got pledged. This leaves Mike and his new group very much on their own. Did everybody hear that? Could our assistant plus the thousand that's already been pledged by... Yeah, by Graham and Anne and That's brilliant. 2295 plus the thousand. 3295. So we are nearly there. We're close on. a lot of other people to tap who couldn't come here this evening. Can I just thank you all very much for coming? Um, coffee is available when I go and make it, if you'd like to stay for that. Otherwise, I clo I'm closing well, the meeting. Thank you. Mike and Bashum's cottage would be one of the closest to the Denbrook wind farm. They moved to Devon 30 years ago to live a low impact lifestyle. Mike's earnings from his car maintenance business have plunged since he devoted time to fighting the development. Their pension plan, before the wind farm, was to sell their home and move into the adjacent barn. The barn that would now have the full view and sound from the turbines. We've got serious global warming issue going on at the moment, and if we don't do something about it... Mike had always struggled with his conscience about the need for the turbines, and initially, his relationship with the wind farm developer Rachel Ruffle had been friendly. I believe that. God, they just put it out for us, especially. <laughs> he allowed Rez to do background noise readings on his property as long as he could have the data. But he became disillusioned by their actions. I get the feeling they've just basically fobbed me off. He questioned what he was being told by their noise expert, Dr. Bullmore. He is totally satisfied that that noise assessment is good. Background noise measurements were carried out without due consideration and are unrepresentative for the area. At the inquiry, he made his full concerns very public, but his claims were strongly rebutted by Rez's lawyer. Mr Trinick, any comments on that? Absolutely no persuasive evidence before this inquiry that the background noise measurements are anything other than professionally made, robust and reliable and representative of all relevant conditions. That would be very strongly resisted by us. See. Yeah. There's a control panel yeah. <laughs> and a, a ladder. <laughs> Three weeks after Mike and Muriel's meeting, Rachel is at a res wind farm in Cornwall. There's a big red button. This is just a transformer housing that transforms it to the wind farm. She's with a BBC film crew from a regional news programme doing an item on wind farms. Where else have you been then? These turbines are 45 metres to blade tip. The Denbrook ones will be nearly three times as tall. So these are rotating about 33 RPM. And the faster they go, the more noisy they are. And the new ones will be about 18 to 20 RPM. They're quieter, actually. There's just two days to go before the deadline for a legal challenge to Rachel's Denbrook wind farm. She doesn't yet know there's a judicial review in the offing, but she's well aware it could be a possibility. There is a slight risk that the uh, people who are against the wind farm will want to um, take, the, take the appeal to judicial review. Uh, OK, that's fine. Right but I, I can't see that there is a, an obvious gap in the process where they could bring that um, case. They have six weeks after the decision date to do that, so I think that might be coming up at the end of this week. If they're bigger, will they be noisier? No, they won't. In fact, they'll be quieter. So I'm quite looking forward to the end of this week because <laughs> if they are going to do it, they'll do it probably at the last minute. I can't see why they would. I think it would be a really waste of everyone's time and money and effort and resources. We also make sure much more now that the design of the gearbox and the generator isn't producing any mechanical noise. Like and this is something that I don't know that I've missed or our solicitors have missed, which is unlikely because they're very experienced. Um, can't see that they're going to have a case and it will just end up, you know, wasting more time and money. It's the next day, and with time running out, Mike and his colleagues are on a mission. Just going up to the parish council meeting at Sprayton Village Hall. See if I can encourage them to help us financially with this, this little quest that we're on. 
The Denbrook Judicial Review Fund has grown to £16,500 in just over three weeks. Mike's had checks in from a number of people whose cars he services and from friends all around the country. They're people I know and are keen to support and back us up and give us the opportunity to, to take this thing forward because there's an injustice here. And I think the parish council will probably be able to dip in, I don't know, 500, 1,000 maybe? Any particular place you'd like me to park? Mike, Nick Jewell, the fund's treasurer, and local resident Ruth are asked to wait outside while the parish council votes. When they come out, the fund is £1,000 better off. There is almost certainly an injustice. It's now their last chance to decide whether to go ahead. Some members of the original protest group are supporting Mike's challenge, but the committee have confirmed to Mike that they still think the chances are not good enough. So he and his group must go it alone. No, that was a result, definitely. His solicitor needs a decision by the morning, so she has time to serve papers on the Secretary of State before the end of the week. So how do you feel about what she said? She said to me today, if we pull out after the first week, we make the first stage, we get the reply from the Secretary of State and we panic and pull out, that's 15,000. In total? That's what she said to but me that's today. Is that yeah. enough to go that, that first stage? I, well, yeah, well, I'm keen for, to go for the first stage, certainly. I mean, I don't know what, you know, I think Muriel's emailed everyone and said she's up for going as well, isn't she? But if you decide that you don't want me to go no, on no, the no. basis of what we've done, I'm still prepared to go with it. Oh. No, they're going to try and beat us, without Come a doubt. On. Would she give you a percentage possibility? No. She wouldn't? She said to me yesterday, better than 50. And I said, 70 would be nice. <laughs> and, and she said, if it was 70, that would be a dead cert. We're going to do it, we're just going to do it. Yeah, come on. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't. Right, that's enough. What would you say? What do you think I ought to say to Susan Wren? Give me a clue. Well, we've got to instruct her. But do I say something very formal and proper? Yeah. Or do I say something like, you know, OK, Susan, let's go for it. Is that appropriate to a solicitor in a, in a sort of challenge the government situation? Do you reckon? I don't know. I just like to think people aren't so cold and you know, matter of fact about everything, you know, there, there is some humanity still out there, surely. Well, there is, there is, without a doubt. I think just please proceed to the next stage. Yeah. Yeah. God, I'm just stumped for words. I think request the challenge, not a challenge. It's probably better than the challenge on my behalf. That's good enough, isn't it? Nothing else we want to say, is there? Do you want to say anything? Do you want to send your best wishes to her? Bonk! Take that, Rez. <laughs> this could be a major impact on my life, you realise this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I shouldn't be so sort of flippant about it all. And this is an appeal by Renewable Energy. Mike's claim argues that, as in the Shipton case, the planning conditions imposed by the inspector at the Denbrook inquiry were imprecise, uncertain and unenforceable. There's 3,000 years of continuous human settlement in that valley. He also argues that the inspector failed to strike the right planning balance between the need for renewable energy developments and their effect on the special qualities of the landscape and on the conditions of those living and working nearby. Data from the noise measurements have not been made available. And finally, the that the inspector relied on background noise levels provided by RES without ensuring that Mike had proper access to and opportunity to comment on the monitoring data that formed their basis. Congratulations. Rachel now knows about Mike's challenge. She's on her way to see her partner, Steve who, like her, works in Morton Hampstead, about 15 miles from the wind farm site. When it came and we didn't actually know what it was, what the challenge was, 
And but once I was seeing the challenge, obviously it was it was quite shocked that it was uh, Mike doing the challenge. It's a real shame it's come down to these sort of two sides, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's gone from discussing it on a really sort of open level to now where we're wondering, well, we'd quite like to see the documentary just to sort of see <laughs> how does this all come about. You never know. Initially, I was really concerned about the advice that he was getting and almost sort of wanted to go and see him and say, Mike, are you sure about this? Are you sure you want to go ahead with this? Because, look, these are the risks that you're really taking and this is what I think is going to happen. And, and just sort of make, try and make him go and get some different advice. But you, you could do that now, I suppose. I could, but the advice I've got about doing that is that, that it would be perceived as intimidation, <laughs> which is laughable, really, because I, I don't think Mike's going to think I'm intimidating him, but maybe he does. Maybe I've got the wrong idea. The other obvious concern is that it's going to cost him quite a lot of money to do this, and what if we, you know, we knew the, 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 we're not the first defendant. The first defendant is the uh, Secretary of State, and if they choose to go for the costs, go for a uh, claim for their costs, then, you know, Mike's going to be liable for that. It's not money that's going to stop us doing this. We're doing something that's real. People need to stand up to this sort of thing because, you know, we've got right on our side, I, I suppose is the best way I can put it. You know, we're doing something that's that needs to be done and you know if I, if I was religious I would say we've got God on our side but I'm Oops. not particularly religious. Steady on. Um, and so is every wind farm having a challenge around the UK? Is it a common Yeah it's practice? totally common and it's totally common for this particular solicitor as well to make the challenge so um, there's a challenge at, at Shipton and on the same the grounds. The grounds look suspiciously similar, but the condition is completely different. Now Mike's claim is in, it could be several months before he knows what sort of defence, if any, the Secretary of State will put forward. He's decided to get on the road and meet some of the people behind the stories that have inspired him to fight on. First stop, Norfolk. This is Shipden. Look at all this. This is all manicured. Isn't it? Yes, it is. Hello. You are must you be Mike? Lee. Yes. Hi. How do you do? <laughs> nice to meet you. Oh, yes. My word. Don't worry. But the whole experience right. is so horrible, isn't it? It is. It's overwhelming. We were told, and I guess in 2002, by a noise expert, he said with the standard noise condition, that are dished out with, with wind farm applications is not enforceable. He said, you must fight it, because once they're up, there is no way that you can do anything about preventing noise. I'll take you to show you the wind farm site. Wind farm company Ecotricity probably didn't know what they were taking on when they decided to build two turbines near to Lee Maroney's home. Lee is a science statistician. Her group have now fought two public inquiries to stop the Shipdom wind farm from being built and are awaiting a third to start. The turbines will be 100 metres high, the closest being 450 metres from her boundary. That's, that's the anemometer. Oh, is that where the nearest turbine would be? No, no, they've, they've put the anemometer, I guess, 100 or more metres back. See, there's um, a, a tree that's actually ivy growing up through a, an old stump. Yeah. It would be about that distance from us and a little bit to the left of that. And, and 100 metres high, so the, the anemometer, which is further back, is 50 metres it's high. 50, right. So, so, so it's twice that twice. height. The developers did no noise measurements at all. But they just initially. said straight up, yeah. our turbines are good neighbours, they will be inaudible at any property. They said they'd be they inaudible? Inaudible. In at really? Any. At our place they said there would be no noise nuisance. Yes. which at least is, you know, it's, it's, it's a half-truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but to say they'd be inaudible, I mean, that is just Probably outrageous, is isn't it? They've taken no measurements. Right. And the council took no measurements. We took the measurements. One of Mike's main concerns is a noise phenomenon called amplitude modulation. It's something like this blade swish he heard from the turbines he visited that are several miles from his home in Devon. If the Denbrook turbines are built, he fears he and Bash could well suffer from it. Because the actual noise is coming from 
shuddering of the blade, I believe, isn't it? Mm, the, the fact that the, it, the, the, the wind at the top of the blade a is speed. at a different speed to the wind at the bottom. Right. And they can't trim the blade right. to but cope with the wind all, all the way the along. Yes. Unless they come um, up with some multi-section yeah. blade, I suppose. People say to us, how have you managed to hold them back for six years? We haven't held them back for six years because we have no power. The only reason it's taken six years for them not to build two poxy turbines is that they have been utterly inept about doing the, the very simple right. things they're supposed to do. And it sounds like you've had a much better relationship with RES. Well, I've had a good relationship with the project manager. I, I never argued with, with Rachel. Whenever I spoke to her or whenever I emailed her, I just if she said something which outraged me, I just let it go. I didn't go back at it. I mean, she did say things at times like, you know, you don't own the view, and it's like, you know, you want to get hold of her and throttle her. <laughs> but you don't. You just, just let it go, and then once she's gone, it's like, there right, she is. <laughs> you know? She's a scientist at the end of the day. She's not, she's not a salesperson. I don't think she could knowingly tell a lie. So did you have an official or some qualified acoust acoustician involved in that? I took the measurements. I am, a, I am a scientist, and that was the sort of thing that I used to do. So if you were given raw noise data, would you be able to, would you understand what it was? We did get given raw noise data. Right. We did our own raw noise data, and the developers gave us their raw noise data. But if I do have a, forget this data, yes, you would possibly be able to sort of, <laughs> Absolutely. it would mean something to you, whereas yes, it, it possibly uh, wouldn't mean anything to me. It certainly um, would, if you ever get any, if we do I would, I would get very it. much like to see it. And we have access to vast <coughs> computer resources, so we've got the machinery that can could, could deal with this. this. Yeah. Eventually, Lee's fight with Ecotricity put her in contact with the charity REF, the Renewable Energy Foundation. She's now a director of this research organisation. REF campaigned for what they argue are efficient renewable energy sources. They are deeply critical of the government's reliance on onshore wind farm technology. In Lincolnshire, Mike's arranged to meet a couple who were perfectly happy with the prospect of having turbines near their home. Until, that is, they were actually operating. Same crop in the field here as next to Lee Moroni's. Rapeseed oil, wasn't it? They are not the first to arrive. Sound expert Mike Stigwood is setting up his recording equipment. Yes, I'm just starting He's been invited there by the property's owner. Hi, I'm Mike Hume. Sigurd, nice yeah. to meet you. Hi. Long journey. I stayed with Lee Moroni overnight. Yep. Yeah, she's pretty switched on. Yes, yeah, she certainly is. She, she, does, so she knows her stuff, I think, pretty well. And yes, she's... and she's been following the topic. Absolutely, yeah. Jane Davis doesn't spend much time at her house. She and her husband Julian made the national press with the story that they'd had to move out of their home to rented accommodation because they claim that in certain weather conditions, the noise from the nearby turbines was so disturbing they couldn't sleep. Hi, good to meet you. And you. <laughs> Jane and Julian have put their plans to develop their house on hold as they struggle to find a solution to their dilemma. Things. Have you showed them the sad things in the, in the workshop? No. Should we get the tears over and done with, then I don't have to cry yeah, again? Just bits and pieces that no. belong to our new house, you know, the rest of the showers and the rayburn. And that's the thing that will um, makes me wobble. <laughs> because it's on hold. Well, we've been told not to proceed with any, there's no point because we can't sleep here. There's not much point re redeveloping your house completely if you're not going to be able to sleep in it. Uh, so, I get upset at this point. So. Do you mind us coming? No, I don't. Okay. I just warn you, I get upset. The Davises knew the turbines were being built, but had no reason to be concerned as they went away on holiday. But when they came back, they were deeply shocked. We thought that there must be something wrong with them. We couldn't believe that anybody would put something up that could make such a noise that they would be allowed to do that. The government wouldn't let them put something up that was going to damage us in that way. Surely. Well, we know better now. In fact, the government have shown concern about AM noise from turbines. 
They've commissioned Salford University to do a report to find out exactly what the problem with AM is. As Mike visits Lincolnshire, the report is expected very soon. This is the bit I find really, really upsetting. I don't think we're ever going to be able to do what we wanted to do. You know, this is Julian's been Julian's home for 30 years. It's really quite hard to be deprived of your home by a policy that's supposed to be really green. There is noise from there. We've got some nice sound and nice music for you. This is a sort of recording of that Julian's done. And if that's the level they're getting, that's awful. That really is dreadful. Of course, the sound is magnified through the speakers but Jane and Julian think it best represents the feel of what it's like to live with the turbines. In her struggle to get help, Jane feels she's just been passed from pillar to post. DEFRA, a large amount of information available on the DTI website. We suggest you contact the DTI. Communities and local government, thank you for your letter, which has been passed to me. I'm sure you weren't satisfied by the reply, which advise what action you might take. As Beach Wind farm noise is regulated by agreed industry guidelines, but AM often falls outside these restrictions, so the turbines by Jane's property are not necessarily breaking any rules at all. I mean, the planning inspectors I know aren't happy. Both the local authority and site operators say they are monitoring the situation, and independent analysts have assessed the noise impact. But so far, no breach of conditions is evident. The Davises claim that these turbines make their worst noise only during certain weather conditions, high winds from the south. Today they're relatively quiet, but windier weather is expected. Jane and Julian's daughter Emily has the bedroom that's most affected. Over the coming months, Mike Stigwood plans to record the full range of noise frequencies with his sophisticated equipment. This is uh, brand new. So in a way we're at the cutting edge uh, of what we're doing here, um, as opposed to what we might have done uh, a year or so ago. The next day, and the weather is set to change. And um, the agents have advised that we wouldn't be able to sell it because of the noise problems, so it's not worth anything at all. So all this should have started last July when we came back from holiday. It's about eight o'clock in the evening. The conditions change as expected but they'll probably only be about two-thirds as bad as Jane and Julian have told Mike it can get. That is pretty much what we heard that way. What we're hearing as Mike and Bash listen is sound taken from the camera. The recordings from Mike Stigwood's more sophisticated equipment show what's actually happening. In this graphic of variations in noise levels recorded in the same bedroom one year later, the erratic woomph of the turbines can be clearly seen. It's a sound with clear characteristics. But to cut out noises like passing cars, the guidelines that govern wind farm noise ignore all but the quietest 10% of noise in each 10 minute period, which has the effect of removing any noise peaks so the wumps may not be an infringement. But of course the Davises may have been woken up by the wumps of the amplitude modulation, and if so it seems there's very little they can do about it. And because it happens erratically, only in certain conditions, Jane can't call out the council at short notice to take readings. For her it's the regulations that are the problem, they were agreed many years ago with the development of what were then much smaller turbines. But there's possibly another problem too, low frequency noise. Mostly it's below our hearing range, but if it's also penetrating this bedroom, then it could be a cause for concern. On the left of this section of Mike Stigwood's graph, you can see the low frequency noise in the Davis's bedroom. Most of the low frequency noise goes off the scale. Mike believes that the AM that the Davises claim disrupts their sleep contains excess low frequency noise, but experts disagree as to whether there's evidence that it has any detrimental effects. It doesn't really matter if there is or isn't, but low frequency noise is something that for some people is a problem, and that, that's just the end of it. It just is for some people. 
it's the age-old problem, isn't it? We just don't do enough research, we just plough on. We never thought about having a full structural survey done on our house before the wind farm <coughs> went up. There are cracks that have been there for years that are now bigger cracks. And things fall off shelves and things fall off things that never did before. I'm satisfied in my own mind that the, there is a real problem with noise. I've actually now experienced it for real and that convinces me that what we're doing is valid and uh, we need to continue with it. We're challenging a major injustice. They should be upfront and addressing this problem um, and not try to brush it under the carpet and pretend it's not an issue. One month later, after meeting at Jane Davis's, Mike Stigwood has come to see Denbrook for himself. I'm surprised. I wouldn't expect a location like this to be used uh, because it is a very quiet location. The alarm bells are definitely sounding on this particular one at this stage. The way they've laid them out seems to me they're asking for a bit of turbulence. Yes, through, the, through, through, through them. Through, through a wake effect. Now, I suspect... And AM. That's going to Absolutely, I mean, that's what I, that's my worry. The government report into AM has just been published. Instead of taking measurements, they asked Salford University to look at how many complaints about AM noise had been logged with local authorities. They found that over the past 15 years, they were a very small percentage. But as AM mostly affects the new generation of turbines, built more recently, Mike's got his doubts about the methodology. The government are telling us that there isn't a problem. Yes, but what we need is a peer. We need we need a peer review of that. And and yeah. but every every page you turn, every line you read, it's why did you do that? Well, surely what about this? Yeah. With that, that's judgment. the other major pitfall with that thing is it, it's looking at two different technologies. In you fact, know, they aren't the only skeptics. Shortly after the Salford publication, it's reported that one of the top acousticians advising the government resigns. It says Dick Bowdler disagrees with the government's conclusions. In a press release, they say, AM is not an issue for the UK's wind farm fleet, but he claims more research was expected to identify up to 10 potential sites at which further objective measurements could be carried out. But the government has just accepted the report's findings and doesn't intend to do the further research. Yeah. I mean, even I can see the way they've shifted the ground to, to prove their point. I think he's absolutely wonderful, the way he's got the energy to continue with this. It's wonderful. I'm, I'm trying to support him as much as I can all the time. Hey, you. There's still no indication of when the High Court challenge will be heard. Come on, then, this way, this way, this way. But as Mike's spending so much time preparing for it, his earnings from his car maintenance business are even worse than before. We're basically living off our capital which is, you know, not a good idea, but, you know, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, we've got no choice. Yeah, we've done, Hello. We've done about three or four hundred. Oh, wow. How long have you lost it? If the Secretary of State defends the challenge, Mike's group will need deep pockets. But they now have the former campaign group's list of supporters to target. Yes, that's right. Amazingly, we've actually raised Quite a lot, haven't we? Well, well, nearly 30,000 in yeah. the year, it's not bad going right. People are from, from far and wide, actually. I mean, the Lake District, um, you know, always oh, amazing. Oh, oh, it very much says to res that this isn't just nimble at all, but again, You're local people. Absolutely right again, there. You know, other people are, uh, but 30,000 might not be enough. They could totally wipe me out financially, I suspect. If um, things don't. If things, you know, if they choose to. I mean, it's stupidity, really, if you think well, about trying to take on David and uh, Robert McAlpine. I mean, that's what we're yeah. doing. Have you run anybody up yet? No. Well, I'm saying I come back at past, I don't know, past one, two o'clock. I can call in again now. Lovely. That's Thanks, Lovely. Yeah. 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 See you later. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. I feel I've got to do this. You know, if I don't do this, I won't be able to live with myself. A court hearing date has now been set for just three months' time. But with no defence yet from the Secretary of State, Mike's side have asked for a delay while the court decides how the case will proceed. 
For farmer Martin Tucker, it can't come quick enough. He hopes to have five of Rez's turbines on his land. They're all bloody trainer. Rez are bringing in some specialist equipment to take further readings up on the wind farm site. Are they here? Are they they're here? Rachel Ruffle has been project managing the Denbrook wind farm for over three years. Rez have just promoted her to development director, UK and Ireland. So she's now a director of the company too. But she'll remain managing Denbrook, which means seeing it through the High Court process, as well as taking on her new responsibilities. Oh, hi. Um, I forgot to tell you something. I asked Dominic to set up the company and he was umming and ahhing a bit, and, but I think we should just get set up anyway, don't you? Oh, yeah. The ladies are walking to warm up. I think it's good for us to walk. Yeah. This is windy. <laughs> it's windy. The LiDAR laser equipment they're bringing in will give them a full picture of wind data at all the different heights of the turbine's operation. We've got a slightly unusual shear pattern to the northwest, and we might think it might be to do with those trees. Yeah, it's called um, wind shear uncertainty. So the vertical wind speed is called wind shear, and we're trying to reduce the wind, wind shear uncertainty. Wind shear seems a common concern. It's Mike Hume's worry that if the turbines are built, different wind speeds between the top and the bottom of the blades, wind shear, could be the cause of AM noise from which he might suffer. It's been impossible for him to check that, as Rez has never given out the wind speed data nor the raw noise data Mike says they promised him. If we release all the data into the public domain, I don't think that that would change anything. It would, the argument would just move on to, well, we've done our analysis and we come out with 7.27 and you've said 7.16. <laughs> and it would just, and that's what's happened before. So we're now measuring five different heights. Rez are keen to get on and build the wind farm. They want the court hearing out of the way but they've heard Mike's side want a delay. We've already been waiting over a year for this date, and uh, we're really not happy for it to be moved back anymore. So we're quite looking forward to the day. I wish it was sooner. Trinic is likely to be the one that we are facing at the High Court. In the new year, Mike's group have an update meeting. The court has now set a timetable and the Secretary of State will be putting forward a defence. Mike's group now have £35,000 in the bank, but their costs are rising. Ideally, they should attend a case conference in London with their barrister, who will be representing them in court. Do you think it's important? Do you think what, it's to go for this conference? Yeah. It'd be nice to meet the guy, but I mean, to put your hand in your pocket for five grand to meet a guy. <laughs> <laughs> in the long run, it is, you've got to do it. I mean, basically, You've got to meet them. Both Ruth and Claire have legal backgrounds and they'll also be living close to the turbines. You don't want them doing leaving it to the I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so let's go for it then. Yeah. Thanks so much. Oh, well, thanks for coming. Mike's group have to have their skeleton evidence in in just 15 days' time. The Secretary of State will then respond and all parties must be ready for court on or before March the 19th. So the London case conference is now very necessary. What if your barrister says your prospects are no good? I won't believe him. <laughs> You're spending dangerously, aren't you? Well, I'm spending a lot of money for some duff advice as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I, I, I believe what we're doing is right. It's got to be at least 30 years since I've been into the centre of London, I would guess. I would think this is where your 80% of people who support wind farms live, isn't it? I came here originally because I couldn't stand the hustle and bustle of the city. And I've lived there, you know, and I feel that a lot of people on this planet miss out on this. You know, you live in a place like this, you're going to think, brilliant, wind farms, wonderful idea. Architecturally with merit for many, and it, it allows us to carry on living like this. Brilliant, let's have some. But let's stick them down on X down in the sticks in Cornwall and 
in Devon, I guess. Which is fair enough, as long as they don't stick them right outside your back door and, and ruin the lives that we've created for ourselves. The bulk of this is the stuff that Trinick sent me with his witness statement. Oh, oh, I have never seen that. Mike stops off to brief Lee Maroney, who we met previously at her house in Shipdom. She'll be coming to lend support at the meeting, together with Ruth and Claire. Oh, is this the course? Yeah. Yes. This is where we're going to be in a be. month's time. I'll come up with me Shepherd's Crook. Thanks. Their case conference is with environmental planning specialist, Barrister David Forsdick. Susan Ring, Mike's solicitor, has arranged the meeting. First of all, we need to understand the limited role of judicial review and these sorts of challenges. The, the inspectors made the decision on the merits, and what we've got to do is find a, a legal flaw in the way that either the inspectors approached it or that the conditions deal with the noise problem. What I need to understand is what precisely was the data you said you needed? It was the background noise measurements that were taken with using the the monitoring microphone devices. Right, OK. And the reason you say you need that is because this scattergraph was prepared by RES, not by Dr Bullmore. Yeah. And Dr Bullmore worked on the assumptions that it was accurate and sufficient yeah. without, analyzing the, w without allowing you to analyse the data behind it. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, as I became more knowledgeable, the developer became more and more resistant to giving me information, as you, as you might well expect. What we've got to do is work on the evidence that was before the inspector and say... The fact-finding continues for most of the afternoon, as David Forsdick gathers the material for his skeleton argument due in in a few days' time. In a quiet area, they tend to drop down towards 15 decibels. Yes. Once the meeting turns to giving advice, we've agreed to stop filming. <laughs> Are you all okay then? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. As long as they don't I was expecting it. walking out of here with, yeah, we're going to go. Uh, <laughs> I think we just need to yeah. mull it over for yeah. a day and get a feel for it, because it's a whole new idea. I wasn't anticipating this at all. The meeting has been more complicated than Mike expected. I like the way he didn't mince his words. And Absolutely. Didn't, you know. And concentrating largely on his particular noise issues, Mike worries it could well compromise his neighbours and supporters' allegiance. But as sole claimant, Mike could be liable for all costs if he lost. I've got a way up. Are they going to put me on the cross and burn me if I go down the, the route which is possibly in my best interest and not in everybody else's? Oh, they being, being everybody, all your neighbours. They being the neighbours. I've got to live where I live, you yeah. know, and I don't want my neighbours thinking, the bastard's sold out. So this is how it normally is up here, is it? God, what a nightmare. Over the next few days, Mike works with his solicitor, bringing together the arguments reflecting his and all his supporters' and neighbours' concerns. At the end of the week, he puts in his skeleton argument and witness statement. Much of it is as it was in his statement of claim regarding the balance arguments, inadequacies in the planning conditions and breach of natural justice. But in his witness statement, things had to become more personal too. Mike has to supply email evidence that he had consistently asked Rachel for the data. Rachel's now been working as Development Director UK and Ireland at Res Head Office for three months. She's yet to consult her counsel, but she's confident of Res's case. Mike Hume has submitted his skeleton argument and he's submitted another witness statement, which is this here. Do you think there's any very awkward things in there from your point of view? No. No, not at all, no. And the you're, main... you're confident? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. The main thrust is the fact that we didn't give them the background noise data, which is why I've kind of blown these up, because these has been published since we published the ES, which was in... 2004, 2005, and this is the background noise data. You know, if it was me and I really wanted that data, that was my whole life, then I would just do this and, you know, measure it off the graph. It's all there. It's published. It's been in the public domain years. So, 
I just is think it's a data that Mike could have had. This is the data. No, this there is, is the data. Out. If this was really all the data Mike needed, then some of Rachel's emails that she submitted as exhibits Mike thought were surprising, including one written in May 2006, in which she said, I don't think providing you with the noise data will help you as you don't have a noise propagation model, and I do not have a budget to provide you with hours of technical support to interpret the data. They tried to say that it wouldn't be worth my while having the data because I wouldn't understand it, which is you know, a bit patronising, to say the least. In his Hi witness on. statement, Mike was saying that if he'd been given the data he claimed he was promised, he'd have consulted a noise expert he'd previously conversed with, Dick Bowdler, to examine it. That he, want, he says, presumably, that he wanted raw data. Yeah, that's what he said he wanted, yeah. And then he could have given it to an expert to look at? He's what? saying that now, which is the first he's ever said that. We've always been totally happy to give the data to Dick Bowdler and for him to, because he, we know he's an acoustic expert and he can, he can do it, we, haven't, we wouldn't have a problem with it, just like we gave the data to Andrew Bullmore. You know, Dick Bowler is, is no great wind farm fan or supporter, but that's just the uh, council saying, trying to bolster up Mike's case. Would Mike, <laughs> it's would just Mike not Hume practical. Lost this, would he have to pay all costs? We will be applying for costs, yeah, we will, because again, we don't think that he's the one behind it. We think he's probably got backers. Hiya. So far, everything just points to the fact that the Renewable Energy Foundation are behind it, and they will have have been behind it since about the time of the inquiry. Mike Hume entirely refutes this. The consequences for me, for my team, for my you know whole life, spending defending these ridiculous challenges, and so you, you, if, you, if you do something, then you should accept the consequences. Hang on, so what I'm planning he says that REF are not funding him at all. I mean, one thing that came up in the conference was the costs. We hadn't realised how the costs have been escalating. It's become apparent that although we've raised what was initially estimated to be the required amount to cover the cost of the case, that we're already well over that amount in terms of what we already owe our solicitors and, and, and legal people. If we lose, I will be liable for the costs. And we haven't actually got enough money in the pot now, it appears, to, to cover those costs. I mean, there will be a point where we'll say, no, we can't risk our home, you know, what are we going to do? Because they'll take it, you know. Um. Less than a month before the High Court hearing, the lawyers for the first defendant, the Secretary of State for Communities and local government lodged their skeleton case. They argued the planning conditions were clear and enforceable and that there was no procedural unfairness against the claimant, Mike Hume. They said that it had been open to him, if he so wished, to have commissioned his own noise survey to demonstrate that Resi's background noise levels were wrong. They also argued that at the inquiry, Mike Hume had been able to cross-examine Dr. Bullmore, but had declined to do so. It's so ludicrous. It, it barely merits consideration, because to do a background noise assessment, you have to relate the measurements taken at the property to the wind speed that's taken on the site. Well, if they're not going to let me have the background noise data, are they going to let me have the wind speed measurements from the anemometer? I think highly unlikely. On the 29th of February, Rachel issues her witness statement. Part of it refers to her initial discussion with Mike about the data. Rachel now says there'd been a misunderstanding on his part and that their discussion about what would be provided related not to the raw data, but to the results of the assessment of the process data. You know, I'm honestly shocked. I know the truth is that, you know, we agreed that I would have the data. There's no question, no question in my mind at all. She's trying to say that it wasn't the data, it was what they were going to produce in the ES. Why on earth would I want the stuff that they were going to give me anyway? I forgot my tape measure. You've got it? I forgot it. So what do you want your tape measure? Well, to measure you up, your suit. Well, I think that's what we're coming in here for, isn't it? So they can measure me up. Well, here's a rare occasion. What is? 
I rang up about, I don't know, just over a week ago about renting a suit. Uh, Mr. Hume. I, that's it, yes. that's me. Yeah. I want something that's suitable for a, an appearance in the High Court in London. I want something that turns me from a local yokel into someone who looks half respectable. Yeah, I think I think the black one probably look um, sharper and smarter, wouldn't it? And how much is that going to cost me? That one is. Unless you want to donate it to our fund, <laughs> you know. And if we win the case, God, imagine you're going to be inundated. Exactly. <laughs> right. right. If I just take the details a second. Well, He's a, a different right. um, assistant. The one that I was there last time was a, a different person that served me. It all helps spread the word as well. Yes, except, doing, I mean, you know. you know, what occurred to me was that he might not be sympathetic well, when he started. Yeah, well, that's fair you know, enough. That he might be for this kind of industrialisation. Of... That's fair enough. Rachel's now moved nearer to Rez in Hamel Hempstead and has been in her new home for just a few days. Just moving up here is a sort of a big lifestyle change. I'd say my sort of immediate lifestyle is probably worse in the, you know, how the surroundings are more more cramped and noisy and also I work harder, I see less of the kids, but the children are older now and I want to do the job well and I want to build more wind farms. It's like producing things, so... It's the day before the hearing. Hi, how's It's Rach here. Um, I've just heard that the exact court where it's going to be held is on the website. Suddenly got faced at nine o'clock this morning, I had to print this lot off. Along with the request for me to print this, I got a request for £17,500 to be sent by today up to our legal team. I think we've got quite a strong case, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. A bit nervous, but just because I've never been in the court before, so I just don't know what it's going to be like. Court 65, the Justice Mitting, M I T T I N G. If it's a challenge exceeds, it would just be like, well, how many, you know, hoops do we have to jump through to get this done? And it would feel like there's more onerous to, to build a wind farm than it is to build a nuclear power station. If we can't build a wind farm there, it's almost like you can't build a wind farm anywhere. Next stop, London, here we come. Has he gone in? Hey, hello. Well, I'll take the money. You take the money. Oh, my glasses. Uh, yeah, I've got them, yeah. You mean your intelligence, babe? Have you got something to write on? Well, I've got 300 pages of document. So how do you think Rachel's feeling now? Well, she's feeling very bullish, I would imagine. I think, actually, come to think of it, I think she's probably feeling very apprehensive. We haven't got any sofas yet. <laughs> but I bought two um, old granddad chairs from Tring Auctions. No one's really challenged noise in a big way before. As far as I understand, you know, because they've got it so well sewn up. So it's straight through here, isn't it? And then up. So do you know the order of things, how they're going to go? No, not sure. A bit stressful this morning, nearly missed the train. So that was a bit, oh no. So, uh, but yeah, I'm glad I'm here and I'm on time, so, okay. yeah. Um. This is just surreal, the whole situation. Totally surreal. What am I doing? Stood here in a suit in the middle of a street in London, outside the main court of the country. I mean, my rightful place is in a field down in Devon. Inside the court, cameras aren't allowed. But initially, as the judge criticised some of Rezzy's actions, Mike and Bash thought that prospects for their future enjoyment of their rural tranquillity seem promising. There is. What was that? But they soon diminished. The judge seemed to be understanding of our situation. And then as he progressed through his judgment, the realisation became clearer and clearer that we weren't winning. Lord Justice Mitting felt the planning conditions should be interpreted Absolutely. benevolently, no so he ruled they were enforceable. 
He believed the inquiry inspector had in all respects behaved appropriately and properly. And even if the data was wrong, the expected increase in noise level produced by the turbines would fall well short of the upper limit imposed. So the Denbrook wind farm would be built. But as Rachel came out, it became apparent that not everything had gone Rez's way. Very early on in the case, the judge said um, that he, he couldn't believe our attitude and our approach to Mike, that we hadn't given him the data, and, and the reasons we'd given him for the data were, were, were not good reasons. I don't think any developer is going to refuse background noise data, again, to anyone who asks. And I also think that Rez are going to have to think very seriously about what the judges said about them. They were severely criticised. And they cost. haven't even got their costs. Was it 16,000 res went for? 15 something, wasn't it? It saved me going into the serious sort of do do financial. They'd always ask again. Ask for the data. For the data. They can only say no. Actually, that would be an interesting thing to do, wouldn't it? I think, I think you yes. should ask. Them. I think it'd be yeah, well worth a, worth a letter, wouldn't it? Mate? In fact, the opportunity to ask for the data comes rather earlier than Mike was perhaps anticipating. Hmm? I am Mike Todd, yeah. I'm okay. So you're going to let me have the data? It would have been a lot easier, wouldn't it? What a waste of time and money. Just over a load of data. So if I write to you and ask for the data, because I really would like to see what is going on. Yeah, you know? I'm sure that would be fine. Ultimately, it won't be my decision. So. so at least there's something come out of it all. The little man can get some something from the big, big com oh, company. I don't see it like that. I see myself as a little woman against a whole big anti wind farm campaign. So anyway, oh, no, I'm going to go. See you. <laughs> okay. Rez would well know from all their past experience that everything is not over yet. Mike now has 14 days in which he could technically seek leave to appeal. Can you put the light on? What's that? Oh, what's that <laughs> from there? I don't know. Oh, good pruning. Barry. Sorry, next door. Congratulations or commiserations? Oh, well, I think it's congratulations, personally. <laughs> we won. We won res, but we didn't win this uh, the inspector. That's the top and bottom of it, isn't it? So where is it then? Oh, the data. The data. <laughs> <laughs> it's everything you asked for. Basically, what they did is they used the wrong blooming data. It's all over. They've conceded. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is an inquiry into an appeal by RES. Eight days of a new inquiry. We're not even going to be discussing noise at all. If nine 120 metre high turbines are not visually intrusive, what form of development would be, please? I mean, the word intrusive is, in my view, slightly pejorative. You really believe that all the people who live near wind farms aren't informed? People live near motorways, they live in cities, they live in towns. I think you've got a lovely, ideal life set in the heart of Devon. Get on and enjoy it and stop whinging. Bash, do you want to come up? It's in. Oh dear, oh dear. Oh, blimey. Hello? My gut feeling is this isn't the end of the story. 